we're going to introduce cyclic groups. We'll see the definition, a few examples, and then an important isomorphism concerning cyclic groups. Then we'll briefly introduce cyclic subgroups and a theorem concerning those. Let's get into it. Here's the definition. If G is a group consisting only of the powers of some element A, then we call G a cyclic group, and we call A its generator, so the entire group is generated by this single element A. We write it like this. G is the cyclic group generated by A. These angle brackets denote a cyclic group, and within the brackets is the generator. So that's what this notation means. G is the cyclic group generated by A. Now notice, just because G has all the integer powers of A, that doesn't mean that G is infinite, since A could be an element of finite order. So even though we might have all integer powers of A, a bunch of them might in fact be the same. So our cyclic group could have all sorts of different orders. Let's see some examples then of cyclic groups. A very basic example is the set of integers. The set of integers is generated by 1 under addition. When we're using multiplication notation, we talk about the powers of A, but if we're talking about the integers and addition, we would be talking about the multiples of 1. And certainly, all of the integers are generated by the multiples of 1. So the integers are a cyclic group with 1 as the generator, so we could write that. Another example is the integers mod 8. All 8 elements of this group are generated by 1. Interestingly, we could also generate this cyclic group with a different element, like 3, for example. Let's just check that by going through the multiples of 3 mod 8. The first multiple of 3 would be 3 then we would have 6, then we would have 9 mod 8, which is 1, and then 4, and then 7, and then 10 mod 8, which is 2, and then 5, and then 8, which of course mod 8 is 0. So we see how the multiples of 3 generate the entire group of the integers mod 8. Indeed, they are generated by 1 and 3. See if you can find a third generator for the integers mod 8. Next, we're going to move on to discussing an isomorphism concerning cyclic groups. For that discussion, it will be important that you're familiar with this result, that an element of order n has exactly n distinct powers, and if an element has order infinity, then all of its powers are distinct. I'll leave links in the description to my lessons proving these results. Okay, let A be a cyclic group generated, of course, by A, where A has order n. That means this cyclic group generated by A will have the n distinct powers of A from the identity element e, or a to the 0, all the way through a to the n minus 1. Then, we could consider a correspondence with this cyclic group and the integers mod n. The integers mod n, of course, contain 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the way through n minus 1. It is plain to see that there's a bijection, a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two groups. We could say that this function maps the integers mod n onto the cyclic group generated by a, and the function is defined like this. f of i is simply equal to a to the i f of 2 brings us to a to the 2, for example. This function has an interesting property, which is that f of i plus j, by the function's definition, is equal to a to the i plus j. But then, by our exponent laws, a to the i plus j is the same as a to the i times a to the j. But then again, by definition of our function, that's equal to f of i times f of j. So in fact, by definition, this bijection between the groups is an isomorphism. 
Let me take a moment now to discuss notation. See, inside the function, we wrote i plus j, because i and j came from the integers mod n, which we are treating with the operation of addition. However, we write f of i times f of j, because for the cyclic group generated by a, we've chosen to use the multiplication notation. Regardless, we see that combining the elements in the integers mod n, so doing i plus j, and then sending it through the function, gives us the same result as sending i and j through the function first, and then combining them under the operation that is in the cyclic group generated by a. So by definition, this is an isomorphism. It does what we sometimes call preserves the group operation. So we could write that the integers mod n are indeed isomorphic to this cyclic group of order n generated by a. And the only thing we assumed about this cyclic group was that it's generated by an element of order n. So here are our big takeaways. For every positive integer n, every cyclic group of order n is isomorphic to the integers mod n. Pretty cool. Similarly, every infinite cyclic group is isomorphic to the integers. This is a very similar result, so I'm not going to go through the details here. You would just need this result I mentioned earlier, that if an element has order infinity, then all of its powers are distinct. That way you would be able to draw a bijection from the infinite cyclic group it generates to the set of integers. This of course also means that every infinite cyclic group, any two infinite cyclic groups, are in fact isomorphic to each other because they're all isomorphic to the set of integers. One more thing before we go. Certainly, the integers mod 15 is a cyclic group. For example, it's entirely generated by 1. But it also contains some subgroups that are cyclic. For example, consider the powers of 3. The zeroth power, or in this case we're talking about addition, so let's say multiple. The zeroth multiple of 3 would be 0. Then 3, then 6 then 9, then 12, and then 15, which is 0. So we'd actually just come right back around. If it wasn't already clear, that's why these are called cyclic groups, because at least in the case of finite order, a generator will eventually complete an entire cycle and then just keep looping through the group repeatedly. A couple things you might notice here is that if we combine any of these multiples of 3, we get another multiple of 3. 3 plus 6, for example, brings us to 9. 9 plus 12 brings us to 21. Mod 15 is 6. If we combine multiples of 3, we get another multiple of 3. The second thing you might notice is that if we take the inverse of any of these multiples of 3, like negative 6 for example, this is also a multiple of 3. Negative 6 mod 15 is congruent to 9, the third multiple of 3. What if we take 12? The inverse is negative 12, which is congruent to 3 mod 15. This means that in fact all the multiples of 3 actually make up a cyclic subgroup of the integers mod 15. And this is the last fact I want to point out. Here is a more general discussion of what we just went over. If g is a group and a is an element of g, then the product of any two powers of a is certainly a power of a as well. Notice we're now using multiplication language and notation. We could see, for example, that a to the m times a to the n, the product of two powers of a, is of course another power of a. It's a to the m plus n. Secondly, the inverse of any power of a is also a power of a. If we take a to the n, its inverse is a to the n to the negative 1, and this is just another power of a. It's a to the negative n. So we have closure, we have inverses, therefore the set of all powers of a is a subgroup of g 
called the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A. So we could write the cyclic group generated by A. This is a subgroup of the group G which contains A. And in fact, this leads us to an interesting theorem, which is that every subgroup of a cyclic group is itself cyclic. And we'll prove that next time. Hope this was helpful. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions. Head in the